You can find this and other interesting reviews on my personal YouTube channel called A Board Scientist's Guide to the Universe. Hello. I have been planning to talk about the phenomenal progress brought by the Eastern Roman Empire. A progress in every aspect of civilization, from technological to social and humanitarian. So if it's God's will, after several lectures, you would understand why I have often asked myself questions like, would mankind set foot on the moon in, let's say, 1798, rather than in 1969, if the Roman Empire was not destroyed in 1453? And if at this point you might find such an idea to be rather strange and entertaining, please join our discussion. Leave your comments below. Follow the next several lectures on the topic, and I believe that you will soon start appreciating the incredible achievements of the Roman civilization. Traditionally, we prefer to ignore the Eastern Roman Empire or Byzantine Empire. This may be due to the fact that we as society perceive ourselves as descendants of the people who actually contributed to the decline and the destruction of the Christian Roman Empire. I mean, every society likes to think that any war it engages in is just and that they always hold the moral high ground. I guess this emotional inclination is even stronger when such a war directly or indirectly leads to the complete destruction of an entire civilization. But today we will discuss facts, not feelings. I've been previously asked what exactly is the Eastern Roman Empire or Byzantine Empire. To put it shortly, the Roman Empire, because this is its real name, the Roman Empire after Emperor Saint Constantine, which is also often referred to as the Eastern Roman Empire, or completely wrongly called the Byzantine Empire, is the Empire of Orthodox Christianity. It is not the state of neither Latins, nor Greeks, nor Bulgarians, nor Armenians, nor Syrians, and so on. It is the state of Orthodox Christians. Actually, I will here mention that historically, driven by the sentiments of Eurocentrism, Western European historians introduce the artificial and completely incorrect term Byzantine Empire only very recently. I will sometimes still use it only for the purpose of avoiding confusion by sticking to established, although completely wrong, historical stereotypes. But do keep in mind, if we are to be correct, the names should be the Roman Empire and the Romans. You could also check the link below and listen to a short interview on the topic given by Lars Brownsworth. Let's now continue with our topic. The adoption of Christianity as an official state religion brings a new worldview and a new morale to the recently pagan empire, which we know so well from history classes, and this leads to some of the most exceptional achievements of human civilization. Following the Christian ideas of love and compassion, the Eastern Roman Empire realizes one of the most incredible at the time and important achievements in human history. Public health care. And I would like to emphasize something very important. Free, universal public health care. And if you're already amazed by what you heard, just listen on. The Christian Roman Empire, or the Byzantine Empire, introduced universal health care as early as in 4th century. This is over 1,600 years ago. For the first time, the Christian Romans created the hospitals as a part of this institution. Probably the first public hospital ever was built by Saint Basil. Near the city of Caesarea, he established a huge hospital complex, which featured shelters for the poor, a hospice and a hospital. This complex was named the Basiliad, and at the time it was considered one of the wonders of the world. In that period, Saint Fabiola of Rome 
built the first public hospital in the very city of Rome as well. Thus, hospitals started to emerge in the big city centers of the Roman Empire as early as the 300s AD. By the 700s AD, such hospitals existed not only in the big cities, but in the small provincial centers as well. I want you to stop and think about something in order to fully grasp the idea of how advanced the Christian Roman society is. Over 1050 years before Columbus would discover America, there existed a society which, driven by the Christian ideals, built and offered free and high-quality health care to all of its citizens, regardless of their social and financial status. I suspect that when I mentioned hospitals, many of you imagined some primordial and poorly organized institutions, which had nothing to do with their modern counterparts. Not at all. The Byzantine hospitals were real hospitals, such as we know them today. Such well-organized hospitals would appear in Western Europe only in the beginning of the Industrial Age. As a matter of fact, extremely poor imitations of these institutions, which could not even dream of getting anywhere near the high level of organization, academic advancement, and professionalism typical for the Roman hospitals, would appear in Western Europe more than 600 years later as part of a few Western European monasteries. The level of organization of the healthcare system in the Christian Roman Empire is impressive. The Romans built a network of hospitals throughout the empire. Only in the big cities their number was over 100. As part of the health system, they also established a network of medical clinics and residences for the elderly. The latter were not only residential complexes, they also provided healthcare services focused around the specific medical problems of old age. Today we, medical scientists, accept that in this way, namely the Byzantines created and established geriatrics as a branch of our medical science. The organization and professionalism characteristic for those hospitals are amazing. They had strict institutional rules and regulations. I'll give you some examples. Every patient had a guaranteed hospital bed and personal space. Physicians had to wash their hands after examining each patient. The hospitals had to hire full-time support staff, which, among other things, was expected to ensure that buildings are kept warm throughout the year, guaranteeing comfortable ambient temperature for all the patients. Medical staff, on the other hand, had a strict hierarchy based on skills, experience and education. They had chief medical staff, regular physicians, professional nurses, orderlies, and so on. Even now, when I describe these facts that I have previously studied, I am still astonished. Once again, just stop and imagine. None of the European states under the names we know today exist yet. 200 years before the founding of the Merovingian Kingdom, 300 years before the founding of Bulgaria, 500 years before the founding of France, over 600 years before the unification of England, in a period when Western European society just steps into the Dark Ages characterized with phenomenal technological regress and underdevelopment, there exists a Christian empire which has an established and functional universal healthcare system. A system which in its organization and structures easily measures up to the modern healthcare systems as we know them nowadays. Amazed? Just keep on listening. The Roman slash Byzantine hospitals had departments and divisions, just like modern hospitals. They had physically differentiated divisions such as surgery, trauma surgery, internal medicine, ophthalmology. Yes, you heard well, the Roman citizens in the Christian Roman Empire over 1,500 years ago even had specialized eye doctors, and so on. As of the 500s AD, the Romans introduced separate wards for women and men, 
in order to guarantee the comfort of their patients. As early as the creation of the first hospital, they featured baths, but by 500 AD, the presence of a bath, or multiple baths, in each hospital became the norm. By 1100 AD, a new standard was established. Each hospital started featuring an outpatient clinic where citizens who were sick, but not to the extent that required admission, could get examined and receive medications, and where physicians could actually determine the necessity of actual hospitalization depending on patient's condition. In addition to the hospital wards and specialized divisions, surgical rooms, baths and outpatient clinics, Byzantine hospitals had separate rooms and even separate buildings for libraries, reading rooms, conference halls, administration, archive storage and so on. The skills and education of the doctors of the Christian Roman Empire would once again surprise you. They were up to par and often surpass the phenomenal social and organizational abilities we just discussed. Throughout the entire period between 324 AD and 1453 AD, there were many doctors in the Roman Empire who were famous with their knowledge and skills in different fields of the medical science. Fields like ophthalmology, trauma, surgery and so on. These medical doctors received an exceptional education for that time. For the first time in human history, the Orthodox Christian Society of the Roman Empire established standardized medical university education. In contrast to the classical world, where medicine was more of a trade where doctors would educate it individually and or depending on the agenda of their specific teacher, in the Byzantine Empire, medicine became an academic subject of study. In other words, the Byzantine doctors were the first in our history to study medicine in universities following an established academic curriculum. I will now stop for a minute and tell you something very, very interesting. I guess you have all heard how women in ancient and medieval history were constantly suppressed, how they did not have any available social or academic opportunities, and uh, metaphorically speaking were bound either to the kitchen or to the barn for a period of several thousand years. And as much as this might be true for the Western European states in this historic period, this stereotype should not be projected onto other societies as well. And now you will learn why. Women in the Eastern Roman Empire had the full right as any other citizen of the empire to get high quality education and to pursue a professional or an academic career. Of course, motherhood and the feat of bringing up children was put on a pedestal, and this enormous respect to mothers and motherhood transpires in the fact that the state provided many and exclusive financial, legal and social benefits to mothers, benefits which were not accessible to any other citizen of the empire regardless of gender, financial or social position. But once again, women in the Christian Roman Empire had full rights and abilities for professional development. And this is illustrated in today's topic as well. Archaeological archives, lists and documents related to that period reveal that many of the medical doctors and surgeons in the Byzantine hospitals were women. Furthermore, a number of the famous physicians of the empire who were sought after and well respected for their skills were women as well. Now, keeping in mind that the Byzantine doctors could be of both sexes, let's carry on. The knowledge and skills of the doctors in the Eastern Roman Empire were probably the most advanced at that time. Standard medical textbooks were created in the Christian Roman Empire. How good were they? Well, think about the following facts. The textbooks of Oribasius, the same surgeon who treated Emperor Julian the Apostate after his fatal wound in 363 AD, would become textbooks in Western Europe centuries later, during the era of Enlightenment when they were translated in English and French. 
The surgery performed by the same doctor in 363 AD is described in detail, and most importantly, the description was preserved to present day, and it demonstrates a treatment of stomach trauma completely analogous to what a modern-day surgeon would do. A gastrography combined with pharmacological confrontation of the wound. Also, Byzantine medical texts written in the 300s AD show that the methods used by the Romans for surgical hernia repair were exactly the same as today's classical methods of this type of surgery. The books of Nicholas Mirepsius, which were composed by the 1200s AD, would become textbooks in the famous medical faculty of Paris only after 1651 AD. In other words, we have an illustration of a lack of about 450 years in the development of Western European medical science compared to that of the Christian Roman Empire. The treatises of Demetrius Pepagomenius, who also wrote them in the 1200s, will become a standard medical reading in Venice only after 1517. You now see how when we speak of medical methods and academic knowledge, the Byzantine society was more than 450-500 years ahead of Western European society. And in terms of the idea of free public health care and its accomplishment, the difference is phenomenal. Entire 16 centuries. This is 1,600 years ahead of our society. So what do you think now? When would man fly in space if the Christian Roman Empire was not destroyed and if it continued existing and keeping 500 years ahead of us? For the purpose of today's video, I took an interesting approach to my sources. Since this is both a medical and a historical topic, I decided to add a number of medical scientific publications to my list of references as well. These are all medical science papers published in international peer-reviewed medical journals between 2000 and 2015, which means that every time you heard a comparison between the medicine and the healthcare system of the Christian Roman Empire and contemporary medicine, this comparison and conclusions were given by modern-day medical scientists and healthcare specialists with academic contribution to that field. And this is a partial list of those sources that features the names of the publications, the authors, the journals, and years of publishing. And if you like that video, please leave me a comment, hit the like button, subscribe. I have many other interesting research to share, and as long as I see that people are interested, there will be more to come.